Hello, my name is Virginia Dixon. I am the CEO of Tender Hearts Enterprises and the author of REST, The Reconstitution Method for Healing. And it is a pleasure to invite you today to a very um, special session. I've invited Joey O'Connor here. We've championed each other's work and convictions um, for many years. Perhaps the thread that ties us or weaves the tapestry of our life together, Joey, is the desire to access, to expose, and to speak to what is most sacred, redeemable, and beautiful about our common humanity. But given the climate and the culture and everything we're living in, I'd like you to tell us a little bit of how this story came to you, because I think there are so many relevant conversations about the civil unrest and the conflict mm -hmm. that we're facing, not as not in the context of race, but in the context of our common humanity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, this book touches on friendship, collaboration community, mm -hmm. and it really speaks to what is sacred mm -hmm. about our common humanity right. in spite of unbelievably dark times in the history of the world. And frankly, I knew absolutely nothing. I just, I didn't know anything, excuse me, I didn't know anything about the Congo mm -hmm. until you sent me the first manuscripts, the first drafts. Mm -hmm. And we've seen many versions of this book over mm -hmm. the last, how many years? Uh, the book specifically the past three years. The past, right. But before this actual book came about, you had other drafts that you did in many other, it's, has it been 10 years or 15 years? Uh, 12. 12 years. Yeah. And I love that because you've taught me something and... You've seen me persevere too. I think mm -hmm. we've shared in this that it all starts with a dream, but mm -hmm. sometimes the fulfillment of the vision and the mission and these dreams takes a lifetime. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's been a joy, but I'm so excited for you to touch on this in the context of, of what we're facing as a nation, as a country, as human beings. Right, right. And in the context of rest. So tell me, how did this story come to you? Okay. And that I can't take credit for because it was my brother-in-law, Ken Straw, who approached me 12 years ago. And he handed me a book and he said, I want you to read this uh, because, I, and I want to know, have you ever written a screenplay? And I told him as a writer, I'd studied screenwriting, wrote one bad screenplay and uh, never went back to it, went back to book writing. So over the next week, I read the book that Ken had given me, and it was about this individual named William Shepard. And a week later, when I saw Ken, it was, a, it was Easter Sunday morning, 12 years ago, and I said, we absolutely have to learn more about William Shepard's life and write this story. And so that began a process 12 years ago of two years of research and then a year of writing the screenplay about the, wow. the most um, unknown African-American hero in the United States. Uh, William Shepard was um, born the, uh, 19, or 1865, the year the Civil War ended. And he was the first Presbyterian missionary to go to the Congo in 1890. But it, his application, it took three years to be approved because they would not let a African-American man go by himself. Um, there was inherent racism within the Presbyterian church. So they finally partnered him with a gentleman by the name of Samuel Lapsley. Uh, Shepard at the time was 25 years old. Lapsley was 23. Shepard's background, his father was a former slave. And it's, it's uh, estimated that his father possibly fought in the Civil War. Well, Lapsley's family, Lapsley's from Alabama, and he was the son of former slave owners. So you have um, a black man, a white man, 
one, the son of a former slave, and one, the son of former slave owners who are partnered together to go to this place in Africa, the Congo, which King Leopold of Belgium had fooled all of Europe and had taken it as his own personal possession. So in that, Shepard um, or Leopold, he enslaved the entire nation under his uh, enslavement for what for the rubber trade and the ivory trade, um, because this was during the Great Scramble for Africa. This was during the Industrial Revolution. There's a worldwide demand spike for rubber. Leopold enslaves the, the entire nation. Um, an estimated eight to twelve million people died in the Congo because of that enslavement. How many million? Eight to What's twelve million. Point? It's uh, it's estimated to be the world's fourth largest genocide, which most people know nothing about. And as a result of that, Shepard spoke out against the atrocities, and it led to the world's first international human rights trial. So the book, Among Kings, is all about Shepard's journey to become a man among kings. Um, There's so many different parts of this big story, but ultimately it's, it's a story of an endearing friendship between a black man and a white man. It's about a community of people, specifically in London, who also uh, rose up against uh, Leopold, a gentleman by the name of uh, Edmund Morell, who started the Congo Reform Association. Mm -hmm. And this cumulative effort to speak out against the atrocities, to speak out against injustice, it eventually led to uh, Leopold's downfall. So it's uh, there's a lot of elements to the story that are just fascinating. And it's um, so in our research and in this process, what we discovered is that everything going on in the Congo in the past 25 years, it all dates back to Leopold. So so there's a number of reasons of, of why we wrote that and um because there's these these connections between present day, what's going on now, and the history of where they've come from. Wow. What's going on now in the Congo in terms of? Well, and that really speaks to, as Ken and I did the research for the initial screenplay, that really speaks to the why. Because as we did the research, we mm-hmm. found that in the past 25 years, over 6 million people have died in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. 25 million, uh, no, did you say? Um, uh, in the past, uh, I'm sorry, it's it's in the past 25 years, over 25 6 years. million six people million. have died. Most people are familiar with the Rwandan genocide 25 years ago. But what happened, a million people, many of whom who were responsible for the genocide, the Hutu tribe against the Tutsis Mm -hmm. in Rwanda, they fled across the border. So 1 million people fled into the Congo and that led to uh, a pattern of two civil wars. And so through civil war, through uh, battles over mineral rights in the Congo, through starvation, through rape as a weapon of warfare um, in the past Six, in the past 25 years, over 6 million people have done. And it's it, the, the uh, United Nations has called it the most overlooked media crisis in the world. And so what led us to Shepard's story was curiosity. When we discovered what was going on in the Congo, it led to outrage. And so that's why we persevered for the past 12 years to keep working on the story, to write the screenplay, to write the novel. And the other side of that, not only is there outrage over what has gone on in the Congo, there's clearly outrage of what is going on in terms of racial injustice in the United States. And for the past many years, as we've seen individual black men uh, killed in the United States and there being injustice, the question that Ken and I have raised is, if Shepard and Lapsley were watching this, what might they have to say about the current conditions here in the United States? And what might a 
black man and white man say about uh, relationships and how to develop endearing friendships. I'm so glad you asked that. I'm so glad you asked that. Can we pause here yeah, for a minute? Absolutely. I'd like to just circle around and a few things captured my attention as it pertains to rest mm -hmm. because there's civil unrest, mm -hmm. there's racial unrest, mm -hmm. yeah. there's familial unrest, there's government. I mean, in every sphere of influence, everything's in a state of flux. There's just unrest even before this tragic event. I'm not sure anything is new. I just think we're living in a time where a lot of things that were hidden in government and economics and politics and corporations and the sports, what was it? A lot of things that have been hidden are being exposed, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The power of one, mm -hmm. the power of one was captivated. It's captivating. I've heard you tell and talk the story a million times. And every time you speak, I write. Mm -hmm. The power of one, um, one man enslaved a nation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. One man and one other man stood like a giant, one broken man with a lot of moral failures. Mm -hmm. And I know you'll touch on those for a minute, but stood among giants mm -hmm. and brought justice, mm -hmm. a measure of justice and exposed a lot of things to the light, right? Yeah. Yeah. That was, do you want to talk about that for a second? Because yeah, that's captivating well, to and, me. And th this is where there's a number of story points about William Shepard's life that are simply fascinating. He came from obscurity. He was raised in, in the town of Waynesboro, Virginia. His, uh, his dad, after the war, became a barber. His, his, um, his mother uh, worked in the Warm Springs Spa. And so he, he came from a very simple uh, background. He wasn't impoverished like a lot of people at that time. Um, but from this place of obscurity, he ended up going to... Uh, what is now Hampton University. But when he was in the Congo, not only was he a missionary, explorer, hunter, art collector, um, when he was in the Congo, he discovered a hidden African kingdom that not even Henry Morton Stanley, who was a contemporary of his, Henry Morton Stanley, worked for uh, Leopold. He built his uh, railroad in the Congo. But Shepard discovered a kingdom called the Kuba Kingdom. And uh, the Kuba King, it had taken him two months to find the, the Kuba Kingdom with, uh, with a guide and about 11 other men. But the, along the way, he learned the language. And the Kuba King was so amazed that, that he had learned the language um, that he ended up welcoming Shepard into his kingdom. He gave him a royal knife that was handed down from seven generations because he believed Cuba to be a reincarnated ancestor who made it into the Cuba kingdom because there's no way any outsider could have uh, known the way to the Cuba kingdom without knowing the language. And so that knife resides in Hampton University today along with what is wow. known as one of the finest African art collections in the United States at Hampton University. So because of his discovery of the Cuba Kingdom, uh, when he was going home on furlough, he stops in London. Well, he was made the first African-American man inducted into the Royal Geographic Society. Wow. He was, he was, uh, he, had, he was invited to have tea, uh, tea with Queen Elizabeth who just so happened to be uh, the cousin of King Leopold. And when he returned home over the course of many years, over 25 years in the Congo, he met with uh, four U.S. presidents. Booker T. Washington was his professor at Hampton and his mentor. Um, he spoke at black and white churches up and down the East Coast. Shepard was known um, for being an explorer, missionary, a beloved man by many, by, by blacks and whites. Um, but over the past hundred years, he has fallen into obscurity. And again, when Ken and I dug into the story, we found, well, why isn't Shepard recognized during, um, during uh, the month of February, where it's Black History Month? And so that, that's where 
one of our motivations is to to raise up this wonderful man who who did so many things and and ultimately rescued a nation against a despotic tyrant who was responsible for so much bloodshed. So again, it's it's uh, Shepherd is 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 a hero worth following um, for for everyone. Of special interest to me when you began to tell the story was the handing off of a camera. As you know, yes. I spent 20 yeah, years with a camera mm-hmm. and it was the first time. Tell us a little bit about that yeah, that's, because that's, that's, a that's great story. always warmed yeah. my heart. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Shepard was ordered by his white supervisor, even though he was the founder of the mission in Luebo, it was his uh, supervisor, Reverend William Morrison. Uh, there was news of atrocities. There was uh, a cannibal tribe called the Zappo Zaps that um, worked on behalf of Leopold. And it was, uh, uh, it was heard that they had slaughtered villages and had taken 60 women captive. So Shepard was ordered to go to the Zappo Zap camp, even though he knew he was going to his death. Um, but along the way, he met up with a Zappo Zap uh, tribesman uh, named Chibamba, and he was a Zappo Zap that, that he had restored to health years earlier because Chibamba had a fever years uh, earlier. So when he, when he met Chibamba along the trail, Chibamba ushered him into the Zappo Zap camp, and ultimately it led to the release of the women prisoners. But when he was there, um, the Zappo Zaps had murdered about 90 people on behalf of Belgium. And so specifically because they were cannibals, they had uh, chopped off a lot of hands and were preparing them, roasting them. Um, That was another thing that was very prevalent was hand chopping ordered by Leopold's men. But Shepard used the camera. It was a Kodak Brownie, and he used uh, the camera to take photos of the atrocities. Those photos were sent to London along with a letter he had written. uh, It was uh, called the Kasai Herald. It was a missionary newsletter. He sent those to William or to um, Edmund Morell of the Congo Reform Association, and it was William's letter and the atrocity photos. Um, were used to get out on the international press. And it was one of the first instances of those photos that where the camera was used to document human rights abuses. That's fantastic. And I think something that was captivating to me about the story that Lapsley passed away Mm -hmm. early in the expedition. Yes, so um, it was it was in the first two years of the mission that they had dis- that they That's had right, a, the mission. established in Luebo, which was a thousand miles up the Congo River. So they were they were out in the middle of nowhere, um, as they understood it. And Lapsley died of Blackwater fever, and it was a tragic loss. So he he died when he was twenty five years old. Um, Shepard was a dear friend, and it was. Shepard, who had to write home to Lapsley's mother, Sarah, and inform her and Judge Lapsley of uh, the death of their son. And I love, I love the story. I love the part of the story. It just warmed my heart when you said that Lapsley handed the camera to Shepard. Yes, yeah. To make sure he documented what he said. And as you know... My background with photography and my work for so many years as it pertained Mm -hmm. to documenting Mm -hmm. the voice of a generation. Mm -hmm. This was of specific interest to me on so many levels. When you talked about a few minutes ago, what did these two guys really have in common? I thought the triumph of the human spirit. Mm -hmm. When I read this story... Mm -hmm. I forget who's white and who's black. It was this hunger they had 
to serve God, mm -hmm. this desire to do something mm -hmm. meaningful for mm -hmm. humanity. Right, right. And there was brokenness right. in who each of them were. Yeah. Yeah. We're not perfect. Right. We, we have flaws and shepherds certainly, like you've said, fathered children in the Congo. But one of the things that was compelling to me pertaining, bringing this back around to, circling around to where we find ourselves in history right now. I think of those two guys. What captivated me about the comment you made, here you have a white man, a black man on this mission. The white man really dies a few years into what would prove to be a treacherous pilgrimage, right? into this calling they both had to go and do something bigger than themselves. But it struck me that what they had in common was they were human beings right. and they, were both, they both had a desire right. to do something of substance, right. of really almost inconceivable. Inconce I mean, who knew what the outcome would be? Right. Certainly they both knew they were putting their life on the line. But I never remembered either of them by the color of their skin. Right. It's a matter of fact, I always get them confused. And I've read the story many times. And I've seen over the last 12 years, many versions. I've heard you speak on this. I've been part of think tanks with mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. about the evolution of this. And so I, I just thought that was interesting when you yeah. asked. Because yeah. I thought I get confused about who, which is who. Because it's not the color of their skin. Right. Well, and, it, and it's interesting because it's it's really the hardship that bonded them together. That's they, right. They face um, incredible diseases in the Congo. Again, this is 1890. Um, they, they faced uh, incredible uh, dangerous an animals, uh, dangerous river conditions. Uh, they were certainly up against Leopold's mercenary forces. He had a he had conscri he had conscripted Congolese soldiers called the force publique, plus the Zappo Zap cannibal tribe. And so they they were up against all manner of obstacles. And it, it's similar to stories that you hear for men and women uh, who've, who've, who've fought before. You know, when, when you're in a, a foxhole with someone, uh, the people really don't care the, the, the color of the skin, you mm -hmm. know. They, 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 they need to have each other's mm -hmm. backs. And when you think about the time that we're, in with our nation right now, we're we're in a time of crisis. Um, but it's been said when you think of the Chinese character of crisis, there's both danger and opportunity, and so we can have hardship and civil unrest uh, break us or can bond us. And so that's that's really Shepard and Lapsley's story. They went through tremendous obstacles together, and it bonded them. It made them better. I love it. That, and therein lies the enduring voice of a generation, voices of a generation of those that speak to the triumph of the human spirit. Absolutely. And I think that's why, among many reasons, I love talking to you and spending time with you and dreaming and planning and collaborating on so many things together. But it occurred to me the other day while we spoke that we're working different plots mm -hmm. of the same field. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And... I'm always looking for crossovers. We always find crossovers. And it's always like, I like your analogy of a cactus, we're cactus friends. But I think it's a time where we need to draw from stories like this and collaborate and really speak to what is sacred about the human condition. It certainly is what I strive to do with the incredible range of people that I work with. You know, at the Center for New Medicine, I'm working with people who are dying from cancer or trying not to die or trying to heal from cancer, right? But there's an incredible range of people I work in between, not as a clinician, but just in educating and inspiring, instructing, equipping, motivating them to step into this place of rest in order to heal. And I think there's so many threads of this story that are relevant, not just to the social crisis that we face, but it's, it's in finding, in reading story, we discover so much about ourselves right. because there's so many points of reference. 
But I tell you, the thing that captivated me, Joey, again, is that I forget who's white and who's black, and I don't even care. I'm captivated by the pilgrimage. Mm -hmm. And the hook for me was that this was one of the few times that an actual picture was submitted as evidence in a civil rights trial. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. And I think this is our finest hour as a nation. And I think there's great opportunity. What you just said was just amazing. Um, they, They stepped into a place of rest, relational, emotional, and spiritual truth. They had to reconcile the life of their heart, their philosophy, and their theology because they were faced with the darkest facets of the human condition. Right, right. The role of relationships, they had to quickly deal with their own attachment issues and the things that displaced and triggered them. The meaning of pictures, these things that feed our brain, right? Mm -hmm. And can you imagine trauma and the compounding trauma? Because Shepard had plenty, Mm -hmm. and so did Lapsley. Mm -hmm the time and age in which they were born, right? But at the end of the day, it's the value of the story. It's all about the story. Yeah, I always yeah. say it's all about the story. Yeah. So I wanted, pe- I want people, whether it's the cancer patients I'm working with or the executive that's at the verge of having a breakdown or many, several Navy SEALs that I've had the pleasure of working with and we've had the pleasure of helping balance their brain. I want to invite people into this story because it's among kings. And I believe what is sacred about our common humanity is woven into the tapestry of our constituents, our spirit, our soul, and our body, is this gold thread of destiny that says what? I was meant for more than this. That's why I'm very, I don't think depression is the tragedy that most that, that, uh, that our culture and our generation has made it out to me. Mm-hmm. It's an indication that something's wrong, right. something's out of balance, right? right? We've talked about right. this before. And instead of looking at it as something to medicate and overcome quickly, mm-hmm. how about an invitation into rest to see what's out of balance, harmony and coherence, right? right. right. There's obviously the allopathic medical model, and then there's the functional model that deals with root cause of these things. Right. But regardless, uh, and that's the world I live in, right? I come alongside the side of practitioners of amazing doctors, conventional and allopathic and integrative doctors. And as director of inner healing at the clinic, my job is to deal with two thirds of the constituents, right? Of of the their constitu of the your constituents, Mm -hmm. your spirit and your soul. Mm -hmm. And the anatomy of the soul is complex. It's the mind, the heart, the will, the feelings that emote, right? Mm -hmm. And so, as I've read the story, as I revisit the story, as I'm hearing you speak, there's always facets about myself and how I respond to crisis, to trauma, to circumstances, to relationships. But I think the thing that's most captivating about your book is the dots that we often don't connect until sometimes we're on our deathbed. Mm -hmm. I see one of the best parts about my job and working with cancer patients that are trying to heal from cancer is helping them connect those dots. Because these lights go on, these aha moments happen. And when the narrative of the body the confusion, chaos, and disease of the body, right? Come into balance, harmony, and coherence with the narrative of the heart, which is often very different. Mm -hmm. And that's synthesized with the reality of what's happening in the spiritual realm. Mm -hmm. When that comes into balance, harmony, and coherence, Mm -hmm. we see amazing things happen. And it's a pilgrimage, it's a story. And so I want to use this for, and that's why I'm so happy you're here. I want to use sound bites from this conversation that I'm having with you because I'm going to invite not just the people that are battling cancer, but I want to invite everyone I'm working with to have this ongoing book club. Mm-hmm. And these two are going to have to be a part of it as well because I think there's a well in here that speaks to rest. Yeah. 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 And it's just... does. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. everything I say make sense? Well, you're you're really talking about two major themes of the book. You know, a story typically has one theme, and then there's sub-themes that are are brought up along there. But I know that you've studied and written and spoke a lot about self-governance over the years. 
Yes. And, and one of the key lines in the book in terms of the theme, it's William's father mentoring him as a young boy. And they're looking at a book together uh, in uh, William's father's bedroom. And the book is called, um, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the book of uh, Kings of the World, not, not the book of Kings, wow. but Kings of the World. So they're, they're, they're reading this fascinating, colorful book about Kings of the World. And William's father tells him, or William, William first asks him, William asks, hey, Daddy, when am I going to become a king? And his father's response is, a man becomes a king when he learns to rule himself. <laughs> and so that speaks to the whole issue of self-governance. And that becomes William's journey throughout the rest of his life. And probably a, 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 a minor theme through the book that's, that's weaved in throughout it you know, what William is after is exactly what you're talking about, rest. Mm -hmm. He's after the restoration of all things. He sees the evil in himself. He sees it in society. He sees it in King Leopold II, who he's battling. And so he is after the restoration of all things, not only for the kingdom of God, but for himself personally, relationally, and globally. I guess at the end of the day, rest we step into these places of rest when we become curious about ourselves and others mm -hmm. without judgment mm -hmm. and without shame mm -hmm. and without regret. And it takes courage. It takes virtue. It takes time. And you talked about curiosity, and that's how you launched into this whole thing. And curiosity and wonder. I'm, I was captivated by that word curiosity because that's what I always tell people it takes to heal. Mm -hmm. It takes having the courage to step into this and saying, what is rest? What is the life of my heart? What is the role of the relationships in my life? What are the pictures that have branded mm -hmm. me? And what is the value of my story? And I just would love your closing thoughts. You on know, that, that's a great question. Um, one of my favorite authors, Henry Nowen, oh. said, he said, never underestimate the power of your presence, especially when you're dealing with people that are very sick or have a terminal illness. A lot of times people go, oh, what am I going to say? What am I going to do? I'm afraid of saying the wrong thing. I don't want to upset the person even more. And so a lot of times words don't need, need to be said. And so for one, not to underestimate the power of your presence, but then there is usually an appropriate time to speak. And that's where I would say, never underestimate the power of your story because it's in the power of our stories that- We're most us. present. We're most present and we all have a story to share. So no matter where you're at, stuck or you're in a place of strength, you know, you just start right where you're at. And because sometimes we're going to we're going to come alongside someone to serve them and other times we need to allow others to come alongside to serve us because we we all have different seasons in our life. So, that's that's really what I would well, say is not to I'm going to uh, quote you on that. Okay. It's fantastic. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. For being here. I hope this is the first of several other interviews. Because, like I said earlier, I want to use this as um, uh, reading material. And we'll talk about putting a few questions. Um, maybe you can create a few questions, a few writing prompts, a few guides to help us with our rest matrix. Yeah, absolutely. When absolutely. is the book final edition of Among Kings by Joey O'Connor, by the way, Among Kings, Joey O'Connor. When is the um, final version out? There's, there's a second edition available right now on Amazon, and that does have uh, book club questions at the end of it. Oh, it does. Okay. Um, but that's for, they're just general book club questions, and we can work on some designing some for rest. And then, um, then there's some fine tuning I'm, I'm doing with my agent, and who's shopping it with, with major publishers right now. That's wonderful. Thank you. So people can order it from Amazon yeah. immediately. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. 
Thank you. And thank you all for joining us among kings. Get your copy. Thank you.